and uh, it's 8 a.m. So we're gonna go ahead and go, get started. Um, good morning, my name is Kim Schuler, and I'm the CEO for the Arkansas Behavioral Health Integration Network. And we are so excited this morning to have our special guest on. We have uh, Ann, Shana, Ann Sanifer with the SHARE program. Um, we are also gonna have Susan Tipton, and we are going to hear a little bit from a provider perspective, um, and with a combination of providers, including Dr. Meese and, um, and myself. So thank you for joining us. We know it's early, but um, we really think we have a fantastic webinar this morning. And I'm going to do a little bit of the housekeeping. So um, we have our disclosure, which is we do not have any um, conflicts of interest this morning on this uh, webinar. We will also put some information in the chat about continuing education. You are eligible to receive one hour of continuing education, that is CEUs or CMEs. Um, we are gonna go ahead and ask you to register, put your email in the chat if you didn't have to register when you joined today's webinar. And then we'll use that email to send out a certificate so you can complete that, send it back to us and we'll be able to get you the CEUs. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna go ahead and um, we're, we're gonna ask you a polling question. And the polling question this morning is, do you utilize an EMR or paper? And if you use an EMR, would you please put that in the chat? We're really interested and that will help us with this morning's discussion. And while you're doing that, we're gonna give you a moment and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Director Sanifer. Ann Sanifer, who's from Shares this morning, is the director of the Arkansas Health Information Exchange, or SHARE, which is housed under the Arkansas Department of Health. She's experienced in program management, value-based programs, and data information technology supporting healthcare and social service programs. And I just have to say, I've had the opportunity to work with Anne the past several years and see the amazing things that she's doing at SHARE. So I'm so excited for her to have the opportunity to talk to us a little bit more about what SHARE does and records exchange. Thanks, Kim. Yes, good morning, everyone. So happy to be here talking to you guys today about data sharing and specifically behavior health data sharing. So um, a little bit about SHARE. If you don't know, SHARE is Arkansas's statewide health information exchange. Every state pretty much has a health information exchange or more than one. Um, we're very fortunate here in Arkansas, we only have one. Um, and SHARE yeah. is actually housed under the Arkansas Department of Health. Uh, which is great because Wade, being part of a state and Mr. Gaddis. Give me one moment. I'm going to mute everyone. Take and then on today's. The great thing about SHARE being part of the a state agency, it allows us to re, um, obtain some federal funding to support our operations. And, and what that means to you guys is we're able to keep our cost of participation very low. So um, over the, you know, and Kim mentioned she and I have worked together with some health plans here in Arkansas. And you know, the health plans uh, really wanted us to focus on data and behavioral health. So it only made sense for us to do this webinar talking about sharing behavioral health data. Um, you can go to the next slide, Caitlin. So um, SHARE is a tool, um, basically, you know, you guys put on the chat that everybody, you know, has various types of EMRs. The thing is, um, EMRs are very much like phones, you know, like where you have an Android and an Apple or Google Chrome. Sometimes those things don't talk to each other. And that's where SHARE comes in. SHARE is the translator of data between the different EMR systems. So we connect to hospitals, to providers, to laboratories, 
um, to health plans, uh, to behavioral health providers. And we collect all that data that comes in, you know, whatever you put into your EMR, it comes into us. Um, and we have a really sophisticated patient matching tool that helps us aggregate these charts uh, from various different providers. So that way, um, when you're taking care of patients, you have that complete picture. So you know exactly the medications and the diagnosis um, that your patient has uh, prior to coming to see you. Um, we also offer the virtual health record, which is a web-based application where providers can log in to retrieve like historic data. Um, the alternative way to retrieve data from us is through your own local environment. So say, I, I saw a couple of you mentioned that you had Epic and Epic has Epic everywhere, um, Care Everywhere. Um, I know if you are a UMS employee, when you click on that external documents uh, button, you know, you get the care everywhere from Epic and then right below it, you get share. So think of share as kind of like um, just an aggregator of data, uh, regardless of who you're, um, where you've been to seek care. Um, the great thing about having that central location for information, it really removes some of those silos, right? So, you know, a normal, a regular person may see seven or eight different providers um, throughout their, their life, right? May, let's be conservative here. And that means that data is being siloed at all those different locations. Um, before, in the past, you know, the workflow was if you were going to see a new doctor, you had to go to your old doctor and get all that paperwork and carry it over to your new doctor so they could read through that really quick and, and figure out um, your history. Um, and SHARE really removes the need to have that paper delivery or that faxing or that retrieval of records. So, in, a, in our preferred method is to do a full integration or a full connection with providers where we connect directly to your EMR. Uh, we build what is called an interface. Um, and then as you enter data, do your regular work in there, uh, that information flows over to us in real time. And then alternatively, when you have a new patient or you have someone coming in, through your own local environment, you can search for information on your patient. Um, and what happens is a call goes out on that interface and says, hey, do you have any data on Kim Schuler?" And it brings it all out to you for you to review. You don't have to bring it into the chart. Uh, you can review and just pull in what you want into the record. Um, we do that. We have that feature to allow providers to review it before they accept it into the record. Um, I know that's something that's been asked before. Uh, we don't take psychotherapy notes. Um, I think for behavioral health, you know, what, what would really be beneficial to other healthcare providers, you know, are things just like diagnosis, new medications or allergies, and, and maybe some labs that you have ran on your patients. All that information is super important uh, to other physicians that are part of that treatment plan for that patient. So I will stop here and hand it over to Suzanne, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the legalities behind it. Thank you, Anne. And I'm going to give an opportunity just to introduce Suzanne. Um, Suzanne is the Chief Compliance and Legal Officer for Empower Healthcare Solutions, and she handles all legal and regulatory issues related to the health plan. The United States Army veteran has more than 17 years of legal experience encompassing healthcare, Medicaid, insurances, regulatory, and compliance environments. And I would like to thank you for being here this morning, Suzanne, and we're all really eager, eager to hear a little bit more about the, the legalities of um, data sharing. Thank you. Um... It is early in the morning, but <laughs> I'm glad that we were able to get this all together. Thank you for all the work. Um, when it comes to the legal requirements, I know, especially in the behavior health field, they have not been required to provide as much information previously, I think, in some of the, under some of the regulations. In this one, as all of you understand, you've got that third party application that's going to be in there. And th this has to do with the, um, the patient wanting to be able to access this data and it's gonna be going through that interface. 
um, the rule is requiring that uh, certain information be provided. It's something that's going through 2022, so it's not all at once. Mainly on this, I'm wanting to know if there's any concerns from the people that are on this, specifically related to behavior health. Okay, if not, then we'll do it generally. Um, I wonder, and I'll have to say, uh, Suzanne, you know, we have been working really hard with the health plan, such as Empower, to really promote behavioral health sharing uh, of data because they know it's so important, not just for PASS, but for the overall um, care continuation of that patient. And one thing we hear often is, Hoy, I can't share behavioral health data. You know, that's CFR 42 part two protected and, and I shouldn't share that. Um, so th that would be interesting to hear from your perspective as a compliance officer. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. So we also have another question. Oh, excuse me. I was just going to say, we also have another question in the chat, which is um, there is a concern about the sharing of records within primary care practices on behavioral health um, records, as Anne had mentioned. So I think the overall theme is what can we share as far as behavioral health data? And specifically in primary care, some of the, our practices are moving to integrated behavioral health. Can those records be shared as part of the um, as the entire record. Okay, so HIPAA does allow, and, and so does this new integration of it, HIPAA is allowing the healthcare provider to communicate with patients, families, and friends, and, um, but only specific information, not all the information is going. Uh, they recognize that these different uh, players all have a part of the patient's care and are critical to that role. Um, so healthcare providers can communicate their, you know, healthcare payment for care as long as the patient isn't objecting. Um, they can, the provider can ask the patient's permission to share relevant information with others, and they can tell the patient if they discuss that information. If the per, if the patient's not present or isn't able to give that type of, of permission, the healthcare, the healthcare provider can share that information with family, friends, and others involved in the care for payment, as long as the health care provider determines that doing so is in the best interest of the patient. So you always have that best interest of the patient part of there. And they have to make sure that that patient is involved. Um, sorry, I've got like different data looking at that I'm looking at up here. With the privacy rule, it's applying uniformly to all PHI. Um, the one exception is for the psychotherapy notes, which you've mentioned before. Uh, those have special protections. So under the rule, they're defining the psychotherapy notes as notes recorded by a healthcare provider who is a mental health professional documenting or analyzing the contents of a conversation during a private counseling session or group or family counseling session. And those are separate, as y'all know, those are separate from the rest of the patient's record. The psychotherapy notes don't include information about the medication, prescription, the monitoring, start and stop times, uh, frequencies of treatment, and results of clinical tests. They do include summaries of the diagnosis, functional status, treatment plan, et cetera. They do not include any information that's maintained in the patient's medical records. So those aren't required to be provided when it comes to these different integrations. Now, a patient can, of course, allow that to be provided. But when you're providing this information, as you were talking about across the applications and primary care physicians may have some of that information, you are talking about prescriptions and um, probably everything up into the psychotherapy notes, but those aren't going to be given that the payment uh, the purposes, those different things would be allowed. And I, I think everyone here might know this, but, you know, Arkansas is an opt out state. And, and what that means is the patient can choose to opt out of that 
that data being shared. It doesn't mean that the primary care physician or you know the behavioral health specialist cannot obtain that information. It just cannot be uh, delivered electronically. So you would have to rely on, on traditional methods like faxing or, or mailing. Um, so one thing we do um, whenever we bring in a facility live, you know, we interface with them, is we talk a lot about consent. Um, and how that information is going to come across. Consent is a field that's always required for shared participation because we want to make sure that the patient owns that, that, that process and they have the ownership of their data because it's their data at the end of the day, right? It's not my data. It's not the health department data. It's, it's, right. that, it's that person's medical record. Right, and, and that's where you go back to if you've got the permission of the patient, um, but in some instances under health, under behavior health, that patient's not going to be able to give you that permission uh, for various reasons. And so a lot of that's gonna go back to what's in the best interest of the payment. Now, certain records, such as the payment records, um, different things that have to be shared among the providers, that would be information that would be allowed. I know that CMS has put out a lot of different um, documents. Uh, if you go out on the CMS website, there are a lot of links to different FAQs and things that can help kind of narrow that down. I was gonna include some of that, but your stack would get huge <laughs> because they keep putting out new information, but they do specifically uh, address a lot of the behavioral issue um, concerns and making sure that that data is private. And like I said, when it comes to that new API interface, that's the patient that is gonna be able to make a lot of those decisions, but they have to understand, and some of that's gonna to have to probably be some type of educating that's gonna be going out in that, those different fields is that those APIs are third parties and they're not held to the same requirements. So they have to make sure what that API is saying they're going to do and not do when it comes to sharing some of this information and what's going to be provided. Are there any other specific questions when it comes to um, what's going to be required under all of this? Yeah, uh, we got one question about what about the primary care physician? Um, what, could, what could they share with the mental health or the behavioral health provider? So they are going to be, um, they're gonna be sh sharing um, things like the adjudicated claims that's gonna include the pharmacies, so that's gonna include the prescriptions. Um, they're going to include a subset of clinical data, um, any of the lab results that are in there. They are also I know um, in, in Kim and other providers on the call, you guys um, probably know how important it is to get that, that information from the primary care physician for, for you guys to, to better treat that patient. Um, specifically, I'm thinking is things around medications, you know, is certainly you want to be aware of what medications your patient has prior to arriving at your clinic or any potential allergies they have to ensure, you know, you're not um, prescribing something that they may be allergic to. Um, so that that's always super important. And Kim and Dr. Gibson and I, um, we had a big conversation about data sharing because I really wanted to hear from them um, what what was important to them, what what would make your day to day easier, and how how can we help you by providing you with data? And very clearly, you know, we drew a line at the psychotherapy notes, and, and Kim even mentioned. You know, even as a provider, sometimes she she's a little uh, fearful of sharing because of the way EMRs are set up. So, you know, she said she has one screen for regular notes and then one screen for psychotherapy notes. So one thing we talked about is um, that's really important for us to know, because as we bring these facilities on live, you know, especially those that are part of the Empower group, um, 
as you come live with share, we want to make sure you feel comfortable with the amount of data you're sharing. Um, so we will go through the, the project with you, uh, with your EMR vendor, to ensure that we're not taking any psychotherapy notes. And honestly, if, if notes in general is something that you feel strongly about that you don't want to share that, um, that's okay. We can be flexible. I think there's um, other opportunities that are more important. You know, like I mentioned, the, the, the diagnosis, the, the medications and the allergies, that alone um, is incredibly beneficial for a primary care physician for their treatment. And for the Absolutely. first year, we, excuse me, I was going to say we had another question in, in the chat. Um, and, and this is for you. Um, Susan, it's does a patient have to sign a release of information for the PCP to share with their mental health provider um, and, and vice versa, since they're both treatment providers? Could you talk a little bit about what are the requirements as far as signing a release of information? Do they have to sign it for each of their providers? Um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about is there any hesitation once, because I've noticed personally, sometimes if even with a signed release, I'm hesitant. So maybe you could give us some information about that piece. So th there's going to be a difference in what type of information we're talking about and whether the information is um, being patient specific or whether it's data sets that aren't identifying the patient. For a lot of this um, under the interoperability rule, a lot of that is going to be um, provided from provider and payer and, and back and forth, that is not going to require the patient's um, specific approval on some of that. When they're signing up with these APIs and different things, yes, that's going to require the patient's approval to be able to provide that information to the API for that patient to then allow, be allowed to access. Okay. You know, another another concern that, that we hear, and in, in this is in the chat, is one of the frustrations for primary care providers is the patients are referred to mental health providers, but they don't get the information back from the mental health provider. And then I've also heard out, you know, talking to different um, organizations in the community, the mental, the specialty mental health providers are also sometimes frustrated because they're not getting any data back and, and they're not understanding. So I think that, um, that's such an important piece, right? We, we have both of these different um, entities, but we're not speaking to each other. So this is such a critical piece of why we're here today, what we're talking about and hearing, how can we share some of this? So it sounds like so far specifically, um, labs, medication, possibly diagnoses, we're hearing we can't share psychotherapy notes this is, and as Anne has said, um, I also do some private practice work. And on the EMR that I chose, it's really nice because it has a feature where I could have progress notes and then I could have psychotherapy notes. So it's possible that I may put more sensitive information in the psychotherapy notes section um, and maybe have more of a bare bones um, information in that progress note that I would feel more comfortable being out um with with other providers well they did put out a clinical data set of the information that's going to be required for year one compliance and it helps to um kind of narrow that down some what you spoke of earlier about allergies and intolerances and that's going to have to do with the different substance medications and reactions uh, assessment and plan of treatment care team members clinical notes but when it gets into the clinical notes it's talking about consultation note discharge and summaries history and physical um, imaging labs pathology uh, procedures in progress it also wants patient goals health concerns immunizations and it's got the demographics and different things like that but it does not go in you know it still leaves out those psychotherapy notes so those for the ease of the provider, they're going to have to keep those separate. Otherwise, it's going to end up being a nightmare trying to put out there what has to be provided and what doesn't have to be provided. When it comes to the API part of it with the, um, with the patient signing up for this third party and being able to access their notes, um, 
if they're wanting to access those psychotherapy notes, you know, that's probably going to be something that has to be allowed for them. Although it's still going to be in the best interest of your patient, depending on how those you know, I don't know enough about psychotherapy notes to know what all is put in there. Um, if all of that does get provided to a patient, if they ask for it. I mean, as it is right now, if a patient came in to get their records, are they getting the complete psychotherapy notes as well? I think that's a good question. Do we have anyone in the audience from any behavioral health organizations that would be willing to talk about the process and what records are being shared? Um, this is Dana Williams and I work for Baptist Health and work with Dr. Gibson. Um, so I'm the privacy officer for our system and I'm, this is my first time to participate in, I don't know if this is a recurring call or one time, but I'm happy that Dr. Gibson invited me. Um, so uh, um, psychotherapy notes by definition under HIPAA are maintained separate from the medical records. And so, um, and they're not, they're not included in the patient right to access. So the patient has a right to access the designated record set that's included in the medical record. So we might be, the terminology here might be a little bit different. Um, and, and so that might be important for the group to, um, to fully understand. So if you're maintaining it in your medical record, um, and I don't know, someone said something about different tabs for psychotherapy notes, um, but if it's a note that you know, is about the diagnosis and the medications and the follow-up plan, um, then the patients do typically have a right to access those. Um, so I could, I could use some more information on, on that. And that would be the information that would be required to be shared um, under this new process. But I, I, that's what I was assuming was that under the psychotherapy notes, that those are a little different. It's not just this is what we've diagnosed, that it's, it's not something that a patient is supposed to read through either, that, that those are separate for the way that you're treating them, but you still have to provide diag the diagnosis and treatment plans and things like that, but maybe necessarily, not necessarily what the patient's saying and, and the, the therapist notes on that. Correct. And so maybe the difference between calling it a psychotherapy note, which is different under HIPAA versus like a mental health progress note, which the patient would have, or a mental health consult note, which the patient would have the right to access. Right. Right. That, I mean, that's, that's how I read it as well. But, but I just didn't know enough about how that broke down, not being a provider, how that broke down in the, in the actual record. So that is very helpful. What I tell our providers is if you put it in the medical record, then the patient can have it. If you, if you need something separate, you know, for your specific notes, then those would be maintained outside the medical record. Mm -hmm. But I guess it depends on how you define what is in your medical record and what is not. And that's something that was even prior to this new interoperability rule or, or any of the other, that was something that was supposed to be how the records were being kept to avoid any of that because patients have always had the ability to access their records if they wanted, just normally just had to come into the office and get a copy. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think, you know, it's really interesting that um, the CMS and ONC have been releasing a lot of rules around um, information sharing. And I think sometimes behavioral health providers are uncertain if those rules apply to them. You know, specifically, I'm, I'm thinking about information blocking rules, which if you guys haven't heard um, yet about it, information blocking uh, rules or, or some new guidance that CMS has released through the Office of the National Coordinator uh, to really, and, and really this is not a provider specific, um, it is provider specific, but that's not who the, this rule is targeting. The rule is really targeting um, EMR providers, and they really want EMR providers to be able to share that data. Um, kind of like, you know, I think in the past, it was like, it'd be nice, it'd be okay to share this data. Um, but now ONC and CMS are saying, you know, unless you have a bona fide reason why not, you are legally required to share this data um, with, with other providers or, or with the health plan um, because they need it for their, for, their, for their business, right? So that goes back to that HIPAA. Do you have a treatment uh, relationship? Do you have a payment relationship? Or do you have an operational relationship to retrieve that data from the providers? So that's something to keep in mind 
Um, you know, I think um, behavioral health EMR vendors are unique. Um, we're starting to integrate with them and we're having to learn something totally new. Um, but um, they're different. And some of them did not have some of these sharing abilities before. And now CMS is really pushing them to share it not only for your benefit as a behavioral health provider, so you can retrieve that data from primary care, but also to share that data back with primary care and other providers to, to let them know exactly what's happening. And I, 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 I can't stress this enough. You know, when we bring you on live with SHARE, um, we wanna work with you. We will go through the fields together to talk about what, what can you share, what can you not share. You know, consent, we talked about, that is a must. It has to come through. Psychotherapy notes, absolutely not. Um, and our team here is very well versed on, on that type of data sharing that they will work with your EMR vendor to find that sweet spot where you feel comfortable, but also you're getting good benefit out of it. Um, and I think um, Empower, I, I'm just calling them out by name because uh, that's where Suzanne works. They've really been pushing for, for the past providers to contribute data because we know and they know that if we can contribute data electronically, that's going to prevent them from making a phone call to you, uh, you know, making a request for records or maybe even coming to visit your office to retrieve um, charts, you know, whether it's for payments or um, for some of those requirements that the health plans have, you know, like passes and regular health plans, they all have to report back, you know, whether they're reporting back to Medicaid on the outcomes or they're reporting back to CMS on the outcomes of their patients. That's part of their day to day. So being able to retrieve this information electronically helps them too and avoids them having to come to you directly to pull those records to check those boxes for CMS or for those Medicaid requirements. And again, what we've discussed out on CMS's website and also on C, you can find the specific data sets that are gonna be required to be shared. So, you know, the goal is to be able to have that communication going back and forth um, so that you aren't having a kind of a hole in the patient's care, they're able to see what all's going on, it's supposed to start making it easier for the providers and the payers to be able to have that whole system there and not have to go back and forth for data. But setting up all of these APIs and making sure that you aren't violating any of the rules is, is going to be tricky in some instances. You said we could find <clears throat> find the information on what data sets are required on CMS. Do you, I know CMS is, is, a, is a huge kind of black hole when I get on there looking for information sometimes. Any specific areas when we're looking at, at um, this information in particular, any? Well, if you'd like, what I can do is I can, I, I've got that information, which is why you keep seeing me looking over here because I've got a huge amount of information over here. <laughs> yeah. I can send you out some of those specific FAQs that in fact sheets that are just shortened to the point because some of this stuff is just pages and pages long. Uh, if you want, I can send those to you and then you can send them out to uh, the different participants that were on this. That would be fantastic. I think yep. that would be a huge help because, <clears throat> you know, the reason why we're having calls like today is there are so many questions and um, we're not all, you know, experts. And so we have to get on the website and we have to review this and we have to talk with our colleagues and we have to go back and forth and say, this is my interpretation. What did, what is your interpretation? And kind of like we saw today with, you know, we have two compliance officers talking, but I think that it's so important because, um, Sometimes I think what happens, and, and I know this happens to me, is sometimes when we when we don't know what to do, we're pausing. And so I think we have to connect with each other through webinars like today and connecting so we can help each other access the information. And thank goodness we have an organization like SHARE who's out there now and who um, has really taken the lead and is guiding us in the process and how we, how we can connect and how we can share information and how we can um, make um, the patient care better 
by everyone knowing what's going on, um, going on with the, with the medical records. So well, I, can, uh, I can send that information out to you and you can send it out to everyone. And some of the questions that people have are more specific and those are easier to, to answer when you have the more generalized question, especially as an attorney, I'm very hesitant to, um, <laughs> answer a very a generalized question with a more specific answer because you know it always comes back well this is how it's supposed to go wait wait a minute it depends there's there's all sorts of specifics that have to be considered as well um and you know you can contact me if there are questions for any of that but i'll get a lot of that sent out to you and then you can share it with the people that are on this call or whoever you need to share with I think we have a very specific question for you suzanne so i'm gonna read it it's on the chat so it's related to teaching environments like our UMS system um, for a student or a resident working on behavior on working on a behavioral health team in an integrated primary care clinic. So you have a resident that's working at a primary care site that has integrated behavioral health. Mm -hmm. um, are they able to preview a patient's EMR information who's seen by the PCP that day or already are established at that clinic? So. Would a resident that's part of a care team um, be able to see that information related to behavioral health? So outside of this, if they were coming in and, and looking at paper files, would they have been allowed to see that information? That's a good question. I, I would think it's yes, right? <laughs> if, if it was yes on that, they would be allowed the same access that they would have had on, on the patient. Or, you know, when it comes to just because it's electronically kept doesn't change who, you know, whether or not they have the right to access that. If they've never had the right to access that, they still never have the right to access that. Does that make sense? But if it's something that they would have been allowed to preview before uh, taking their next steps, then they would still be allowed to preview it on the system. So, yeah, to me, that would fall under the treatment portion of what's allowable, right? So that resident that's working on that care team. Are they part of that, that, that care team for that patient? So do they have a treatment need to access it? And I, 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 you know, I think about this almost every day. Okay, what's this access? Is it treatment? Is it payment? Or do they have an operational need? And when we talk about operational need, um, I think sometimes people get a little, um, it's a little bit of a gray area. But, you know, if you are, say, a care coordinator that's working on hospital follow-up, then you have a need to access that information. So you know that the patient's been to the hospital so you can give them a call and see how they're doing. So then you are, you're part of that operational need. Or um, I know here at the health department, we've opened up a very limited set of data to those that work in flu billing. So then they can review the patient's insurance information. And that's all they can see, name, phone number, and what insurance they have. So as they come into the local health units to get a flu shot, then the, that person at the registration desk can see who their insurance uh, provider is. So we always try to err on the side of minimum necessary, right? What's the minimum right. necessary amount of data that you need to make your, to, to be able to do your day-to-day -day work? Um, and then do you have that relationship with that patient treatment or operational to be able to retrieve that information, but yeah. never psychotherapy notes. <laughs> yeah, and those, those requirements aren't going to change. The, the biggest change is just having, being able to put all that information out there. And then those that do have the right to access can access it. You know, prior to that, the information wasn't even out there to be able to access but you're still, it's still going to be broken down. I mean, certain people do not need to have access to certain notes. I mean, certain records, there's no reason for that. That hasn't changed. And we have a question. Dr. Gibson, um, go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, this is really interesting and useful in terms of the interoper interoperability rule. But also, Suzanne, I wonder if you have some comments on the general kind of mythological or practices that, uh, as Dr. Chad Rogers just said, he may refer a patient to therapy. The patient gets seen by a school therapist, but then when the patient comes back to his office, he doesn't, he doesn't have any records from the school therapist. And this even happens when it's not a school therapist, but just a specialty therapist or a psychiatrist. 
we tend to have a belief that it's not legal for um, perhaps because of HIPAA or other things that it's not legal for uh, mental health providers, psychiatrists or therapists to share that information generally with their primary care provider or other physicians or care teams. So Suzanne, I don't know if you can comment on just the general thoughts that we should not be sharing information with each other who are referring to each other. So when it comes back down to those certain clinical data sets and when it, you know, that difference between that and the psycho psychotherapy notes, yes, that information, you know, what the treatment plan is, if there's a diagnosis, if there's certain medications prescribed, those things are going to need to be shared with that primary care physician. However, if say you send them to another therapist and that therapist has their own notes not having to do with that clinical data set, then that's going to be where the patient's going to have to say okay to those specific type of notes. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, we are having more and more schools pop up with the, the school-based clinics. The, the good news about that is the majority of those tend to be uh, federally qualified health care um, systems, FQHCs. Um, we do have um, all but two um, FQHC organizations. They're currently contributing data to share. So hopefully, you know, if the student goes to one of those school-based, I think Mainline, for example, has several in school settings, um, then you, Dr. Rogers, you could retrieve that information through your, through your EMR or through the virtual health record. And again, it's going to be specific to, like you said, if that's a, uh, if it's a federally set up or if it's a different type of therapist, those are going to play into that as to what they have to share and what they don't have to share. But it's still kind of going to break down into that if they're progress, uh, progress notes, medications, treatment plans, um, payment information, those type of things, those would have to be shared. And we had uh, another question in the chat, which is, um, can you share the type of psychotherapy and the duration plan for psychotherapy? That would fall under the treatment plan, I would think. So that would be part of that clinical data set that would need to be shared. But again, you wouldn't get into the specifics of the actual note, the psychotherapy notes. And right, what's being I, said in the session, simply right. this is the type of, of treatment we're recommending and this is the estimated duration of treatment. Yeah, that would have to be shared from, from the way that I'm reading this, yes. Okay. Which I think could be extremely helpful and give you know um, both primary care and the behavioral health providers an idea of what type Oops, I muted myself. What type of treatment is happening and, um, and how long? So I think that that's, that's really important. Um, did anyone um, want to elaborate on that or have any, have any thoughts about we can share the, um, the specific type of psychotherapy and the duration and the treatment plan? Okay, so, so confirmation in the chat um, that yes, Suzanne, we are saying that um, treatment plans, diagnoses, and medications have to be shared between treatment providers. Correct, but not getting in again, as we keep pounding the psychotherapy. Yes. 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 Not and as long as the patient, you know, doesn't opt out. <laughs> correct, correct. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Um, somebody, uh, Dr. Gibson asked, um, if our Epic is connected with SHARE, how much of our records are in SHARE? And I think you're speaking specifically about UAMS, right? I think. And I'll have to check on that because UAMS was actually one of the very first connections we brought on live to SHARE. And I think at that time, they did not include behavioral health, but that is something where we're going back uh, to Dr. Sanford over at UMS to 
to have a discussion about it, um, especially I think with, um, was it PRI, um, them having that institute and all that. So um, that's something that's on our radar, but I, I believe right now, um, Dr. Gibson, if you're using EPIC, you can retrieve the data from SHARE, but I do not believe that UAMS behavioral health, if it's done at that specific behavioral health site, I do not believe that's included in SHARE today. Oh, and ba oh, I'm sorry, uh, Baptist. I'm gonna, Justin, I'm gonna defer to you since you worked on that connection. Hey everyone, thanks for being on the call today. Um, yeah, I think that's one thing um, at the very beginning with behavior health data at UMS, it was set up on, you know, just kind of a, a precaution type um, setup uh, when it comes to PRI. But as we progressed, I always like to look at as we progress with their iPhone, right? As we progress with new rules of the road, um, the Cures Act with ONC, CMS, and with the electronic, I think there's opportunity, and we have been having conversation with them, um, with UMS, because, you know, of course, we get it from the specialists and the primary care, but pri with PRI or any kind of behavioral health uh, treatment that happens at um, certain clinics or even from an inpatient stay, I think they have limited that data set just on the side of precaution. I think that is changing. We're having conversations um, uh, to the fact uh, because uh, of the, you know, data sharing is so important uh, with procedure, you know, what we've been speaking of today. Um, and I think it, they see it as a benefit. When we think of a clinically integrated network, we also think of not just that it happens at that hospital health system, but also that it makes it what makes its way to that community-based community health provider, whether it's a social worker, psychologist, counselor, or psychiatrist. And so us making these connections that it's it's that bi-directional uh, communication. So that doesn't just happen in Little Rock, but it goes back to Clinton, Arkansas, that it goes back down to Monticello, Arkansas, so that we have healthier patients. But that's something, like Ann said, we will still continue to work with UMS and validate that data coming over. And for Baptist, uh, Dr. Gibson, we just get a very limited data set from Baptist. We just get um, the notification that the patient's been admitted or discharged from the hospital specifically. But we have been working with Rob um, over at Baptist. He's kind of over the Epic stuff. And uh, we're expanding that data set too. So hopefully very soon we'll be able to share Baptist information with the other providers that are currently connected to SHARE. Yep, we are getting the admission discharge transfer from the ambulatory as well, um, but we're working on another connection and I won't bore you with how that's gonna be queried and get a response on the specific data sets. It's more of a, a national exchange, but um, I think there's a great opportunity to be able to um, get that in the Baptist system or UMS system and then to all of our community providers. Yeah. Thank you so much for commenting, Justin. We do have um, a couple more questions in the chat, and I just wanted to read those. Um, so one of the questions is they just wanted to clarify the full, and, and maybe you could help us with this, um, Suzanne, is to clarify the full initial assessment completed by B to clarify the full initial assessment completed by the behavioral health specialist. I'm guessing will, um, I guess the question is, will we be able as behavioral health organizations be able to um, share the full initial assessment? I'm assuming the intake. Oh, I think there's, that was a clarification. Uh, oh, the okay. original question was, um, would the full initial assessment be uh, need to be shared from the very first visit with the PCP or just the treatment plan, the diagnosis, and the medication? So once, I guess, the patient first comes in, you guys do a, an overall assessment on them. Um, would that be something that's appropriate to be shared, or should they just limit it to the treatment plan, the diagnosis, and the medications? And so that's probably a diagnostic assessment or a 90791. Yeah. 
You're on mute. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Some of that gets into the specifics of the different types of forms that providers are filling out and, and what section that they would apply in that I don't have that specific knowledge of specific provider forms, but if it is a diagnostic tool, then it's probably, you know, a diagnostic assessment is probably going to be part of that medical record and not fall under that, the psychotherapy notes area. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, we also have another comment in the chat, which is, unfortunately, we've heard that sometimes inpatient psychiatric units at facilities um, are not able to, for one reason or another, share records, even with their own outpatient providers, sometimes even within the same system. And so one of the things that we, that I wanted to ask um, maybe out there, are other people experiencing that? And what are some possible suggestions? Because I think that this is a really important piece of what's happening. If we're working within the same system and we're not sharing records with each other, it makes it really difficult with outside um, partners. Is anyone else experiencing this, that they're having difficulty um, receiving records possibly from an inpatient psychiatric unit, um, that the unit may not be sharing records and or that records are not being shared within the same organization system. I've heard of this, uh, you know, and not, and unfortunately this this problem is not specific to behavioral health. We often sometimes hear of um, even clinics that are part of the same health system, they're unable to retrieve records from their own referring hospital because sometimes they're on different platforms. So that can be an issue. I think Suzanne, what, um, what folks get so caught up on or are so um, sensitive to is the CFR 42 part two. So one thing we hear um, sometimes is, well, am I not a CFR 42 part two organization? You know, how do you distinguish um, an organization from, I guess, a general behavioral health or mental health provider from a CFR 42 part two um, organization? Is that something they have to register for or is there specific types of treatment that they provide? So when they're looking at, um, I'm trying to see under the definitions for part two. So if they're talking, if they're qualified services organization, then they're providing the services under part two, um, processing, billing, collection, dosage, um, entered into agreement with part two program. And so what you're looking at is whether or not all mental health providers, or if they've distinguished it out as to which ones would or would not fall under this. It's my understanding that part two regs are specific to substance abuse disorder treatment providers. And so mental health can be, those records can be separate from substance abuse disorder treatment. Um, so at Baptist Health, we have defined which units care for those patients, which um, therefore what units apply um, are subject to the Part 2 regs. Yes. Let me ask, what, um, we, we had one more question and I just wanted to, let's see if I could find it here. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm curious, and, and there's a question in the chat about under 42 CFR part two, what, um, what information can be shared about substance use disorder because the federal law is stringent about protecting information about substance use disorder. And I'm curious specifically when we're looking at um, integrated behavioral health visits within a clinic, substance use disorder is something that is screened for and will be addressed because it is part of a, um, it, it is a, uh, under the, 
you know, when we treat the whole person, it's part of the, the medical issue that we're addressing. So um, any words of guidance on what we can share about substance use disorder um, within the health system, whether that's specialty behavioral health clinics and or primary care? Well, now back to the, the part two programs. So they're federally assisted programs and they're prohibited from disclosing information that identifies a person as having a substance use disorder, unless the person's providing the consent. Um, apparently part two is specifying a set of requirements for consent forms, name of the patient, names of individuals and entities permitted to disclose it, and the amount, of kind, amount and kind of information to be disclosed. Um, but that is specific to the substance use disorder. Um, it's in, they don't want, as most of you know, so that it was intended to ensure that they're receiving the treatment, but not having to face some of the adverse consequences in criminal uh, and domestic proceedings. Because mm -hmm. if, if that stuff is allowed to be out everywhere, then of course they're not gonna seek treatment most of the time. Sure. I think if that's you go back and, and the protections that are allowed under part two are still going to be allowed in information that you're sharing to a certain extent. It's who you're allowed to let that information out to. You're not going to be able to give that um, unless a court has ordered you to, and then still some of that's not allowed for certain reasons, but you're still going to have to have some of that information out there. I mean, if you've prescribed a substance you did, uh, person has a substance use disorder, uh, medically assisted treatment uh, to help them do that, that prescription is going to be out there and it really doesn't take a whole lot to put two and two together. So again, a lot of that is going to have to be looked at under part two and under the new rules with the data sharing and how that data sharing is then being segmented to who is allowed to see what parts of it. Is that making sense or just making it even more confusing? That's that's really helpful um, information. And, you know, as I'm thinking about, that's a great point. Once the prescription is given, um, especially if it's given for, um, you know, MAT, we can um, put two and two together, as you said, but I think that this is something that we'll probably have to continue to think about and talk about, especially as we're talking about doing more integrated behavioral health across our clinics. I think that um, one of the things that happens is we're documenting um, just in the same notes as the primary care provider is documenting and in the same area of the chart. And so I think that it's really important to, um, for us to continue the conversation, to be aware of that, especially if someone is an MAT waivered provider um, in a primary care setting, providing that prescription, that is part of the medical chart. And so those notes are, are shared. It's just not specifically going into to detail potentially about what's being shared personally or the counseling piece. Is that correct? Yeah, and part two is very specific about, you know, I mean, it can all be shared if you've got the consent of the, client, uh, of the, the patient. There's a, a really good, and I'm looking at that now, that was put out by um, ONC and SAMHSA that talks about disclosure of substance use disorder patient records, just part two apply to me. And that also gets into some um, scenarios of different information like you're talking about and the integra integrated situations where you've got uh, a primary care and an integrated care setting with all of this going on. And it gives you some scenarios about how and who and what would be covered. So I'll send that out as one of the documents as well. That's a fantastic way to, to wrap up. I can't thank you enough um, for your time today and your attention. This is um, such an important topic 
And as we've heard, there's a lot of um, specific detailed information and we could um, easily get caught in the weeds. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, Director Sanifer and um, Ms. Tipton for your time today and sharing all of your information and um, giving us some guidance as we move ahead uh, down this path and um, let's stay connected. Let's continue the conversation. We'll get the resources out there. Um, and if you have any questions or need more information, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll see you in September. That's good. Thank you, Kim. And if you talk to Dr. McClellan, uh, wish her well and tell her we're thinking of her and her family. Thank you, Ann. Take care. All right, I'm signing.